What makes a great leader great? How do we create a high-performing team? And when we say leader, we mean everyone, because everyone is leading their own life. Will yours be a life by design or a life by default? Those are the big questions, and this podcast will answer them. Welcome to the Becoming Your Best podcast, where we help you apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders, because great leaders will produce great results. All right, welcome back to all our Becoming Your Best podcast listeners, wherever you're at in the world today. And, you know, this is going to be an extraordinary podcast. I can tell you that without even having (laughs) jumped into it yet. We have someone who I just recently met on here, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But I really want to set the stage and preface this. You know, I know there's a lot of listeners throughout the world. We have CEOs, we have frontline employees, we have people that work out of their home. There's a wide swath of people. And, you know, it's been interesting over the last few decades in our culture, it's almost been this move away from being able to have open conversations. What I mean by that is there's this almost this worry that people get offended so easily in our culture that it it seems like there's a lot of things that we can't talk about that are off limits for the fear of offending others. And that's unfortunate because there's so many conversations that we could be having with others if we were willing to have an open mind and an open dialogue and not and not worry about offense. And, you know, one of those discussions is around God and Christ. And There's so much to be had by discussions, whether a person believes in him or not, or wherever they're at in their beliefs, there's so much to be had from an open discussion. And I have on the podcast today someone who is literally influencing the world. And I believe that what he's doing is very much divinely guided. And so I'm so grateful for Dallas Jenkins being on the podcast today. And just by a very brief way of introduction, I'm going to set the stage for this. And then, Dallas, you can tell us a little bit more about you and your background. Dallas, along with his incredible team, has put together a series called The Chosen. And the first, we'll say, series is an episode of eight videos. And if I understand correctly, they're trying to put together eight more in this series that really encompasses the Gospels in the Bible. And it was so moving and so touching as I finished the eighth episode that I thought, man, I've got to do whatever I can to help spread this message. This is a message of hope. It's a beautiful message and probably one of the best portrayals of Christ that I've ever seen in a series. And and I really do believe that this is divinely inspired. So I would hope that as listeners, that we can all be open-minded, give this podcast a chance, (laughs) you know, regardless of where you're coming from and watch this movie, The Chosen. Dallas is the producer, the director, and we're going to get into how this all came about. You know, what were his thoughts on this? Where is it going? But they just passed, I believe, 32 million views. And and this is something that if you haven't heard of it, you will, well, certainly in this podcast, but this is going to be something that continues to grow. So with all that being said, Dallas, thanks for being on the podcast and tell us a little bit about you, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. I'll start real quick just with a clarifier about The Chosen, and then I'll work my way backwards. The Chosen is the first ever multi-season show about the life of Christ. So uh, you referenced videos and episodes. Season one was eight episodes. It's out now. We intend to do about seven or eight seasons. There's been movies and there's been miniseries about the life of Christ, but there's never actually been a multi-season show that you can binge watch and follow from year to year and get really dig deeper into the stories and into the people in the show. And so right now we are developing season two and are hoping to be shooting it sometime this year, but that all depends on on uh, quarantine rules and all that. So working backwards, I've been in the movie business for 20 years or so, maybe a little bit longer than that. And The Chosen actually was birthed out of my biggest career disappointment. I actually hmm. had a failure in my in my career a few years ago, and that ultimately led to The Chosen. But for about 20 years, I've been making movies in uh, Hollywood and in the Chicago area where I live now. That's where I got to where I am today. So tell us about the birth of the idea of The Chosen. <laughs> you just alluded to it, so so expand on that. Well, I in 2010, I moved from L.A. back to Chicago, where I'd grown up. A, a huge church in the Chicago area wanted me to come on staff and to make movies and short films through the through with them and through their through their structure. So for about 10 years, I'd been in L.A. and I'd been doing pretty well and was kind of growing in my reach and in my impact in the industry. Had directed a few movies that were doing well. Uh, When I went back to Chicago, one of the reasons was, was that I thought, you know, I I love 
my faith. I love the church, the Church of America, to use a very, very broad term. But oftentimes the relationship between Christians and Hollywood was very tenuous. And usually if you heard of a relationship between a church and Hollywood, it was in the form of a boycott. But that's been changing a lot. But there, there was always this kind of separation between people of faith and Hollywood. And I thought, well, the opportunity to do movies within the context of a church uh, that had the means to do movies w- at a budget level that I thought was appropriate was was a really interesting opportunity. And so very, very long story short, I did multiple short films and vignettes for my church's Good Friday services and Christmas Eve services. And it, while we were developing another feature film project, and one of the cool things about it was was that when I was in Hollywood, a lot of my projects had been done independently. So meaning they were financed by my father and some of his and some investors that we had we had procured ourselves but i hadn't really made it in hollywood that was kind of my goal i always wanted to make it i wanted to be wanted to be able to work with really prominent producers my biggest goal in life was to win an academy award that was something that i thought about all the time and every time i'd watch the oscars it was important to me to imagine myself uh, in that environment in some way but it wasn't until i'd been working at this church for several years that one of the short films that I did for our Christmas Eve service got in the hands of one of the biggest producers in Hollywood. This guy by the name of Jason Blum, who runs Blumhouse Productions, and Blumhouse is known for some of the most successful horror films of the last <laughs> 10 years. You know, So every monstrously successful horror film you can think of was probably done on a relatively low budget by Blumhouse, whether it's Get Out or Sinister, Insidious, you know, Paranormal Activity, all these projects. And they were interested in faith-based movies and had seen my short film and absolutely loved it. And so they wanted to work with me. And then they also got financing from WWE, the wrestling company. They have a film division. And so they, they've, they've had some success. And so a horror film company, a wrestling company, and a church in Elgin, Illinois combined to develop this movie that I had been working on, uh, the script. And it was really exciting because these, this is what I had wanted for so many years. And I had this opportunity. They were putting up all the money, so the church didn't have to put up any money. My investors that I knew didn't have to put up any money. Hollywood was putting up the money, and they wanted me to be able to control the content. They were interested in the faith-based market. It was a film called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, and it was a movie that we were all excited about. We shot the movie. They tested it and for some, with the test audiences, and it scored higher than any movie they'd ever done. Like they were really excited. They were planning on doing multiple movies movies with me over the next 10 years. So I was a director with a very bright future and had essentially arrived with my dream scenario. And then the movie was released in theaters January of 2017, and it was a complete failure. You know, within a couple hours, we could tell from the numbers that it was a bomb. It was lower than their lowest projections. Huh. And in just a couple hours, I went from a director with a bright future to a director with no future. And all those companies went back to where they to what they knew best and didn't really have an interest in, in keeping their toes in the faith-based waters. And uh, so I was really confused and my wife and I were home alone crying and like I said, confused, just wondering where all, what, what, what could have gone wrong and what did we miss, especially because it had felt like God had been so present in this whole process. For whatever reason, we didn't know at the time, but God really impressed powerfully on my wife's heart two things. One was the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels, where Jesus takes loaves and fish and multiplies them and feeds a whole group of people. And the other was the phrase, I do impossible math. I love that phrase, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's a great phrase, but we we wanted to know what it meant. (laughs) And uh, we we didn't exactly know what it meant or what its relevance was, but that we just know that that phrase was just really impressed on my wife's heart from God. And um, we thought it meant that maybe these early numbers— that seemed so low would magically turn around and that the box office would have this miraculous recovery and that he was kind of giving us an indication that this wasn't over yet. And that didn't happen. And then when we read The Feeding of the 5,000, we saw that he did, in fact, feed 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish and multiplied them in a miraculous way. That seemed to be another confirmation that something big was going to happen. And uh, when it didn't, we were again still confused, just wondering, what what is God doing here? And uh, one of the things we noticed, though, when we were reading the story in the Gospels, even though we've heard it so many times, that we hadn't noticed before was that uh, when it came time for Jesus to uh, feed the, the, the crowd, 
he actually had the disciples do what they didn't need him for, which is he had them uh, go find the food. He had them distribute it once he had multiplied it. So he could have just magically allowed the food to just appear in their, everyone's laps, but he he still used the disciples and the people around him. And uh, so we found that, th- thought that was interesting, but we didn't know what it meant. And then the other thing that was really fascinating was that when you think about that story, you realize that it was actually Jesus's fault, for lack of a better term, that the people were as hungry as they were. He was, in fact, responsible for the need for the miracle. He had been speaking for three days. The people were so tired that when the disciples told Jesus that that they needed to go home to get food, Jesus said, no, they're so tired, they'll faint along the way. Mm -hmm. So he knew everything. He knew the problem. He, in fact, he was responsible for it. And so we thought, okay, that may, that maybe that does mean that God is in this in some way, that he's not, this isn't happening outside of his will. And so we don't know what it means. We don't know what the future holds, but, but we're, we're open. And that night at four o'clock in the morning, I was sitting on my computer and I was doing what I'm guessing you've done and what a lot of your listeners do, which is, uh, especially if you're a leader or a visionary of some kind is uh, always do a postmortem when something goes wrong. You analyze what went wrong, what you could have done differently, what others could have done differently. And so I was putting together this 15-page memo that was an, an analyzing where I was at fault and where others were at fault and how we could have prevented this and how I might want to prevent it in the future. And a message popped up on my computer at four in the morning from someone that I actually haven't even met, just a Facebook friend of mine who I barely know. We've talked maybe once a year. And I didn't say hi. It didn't say hello. didn't say heard about your movie. It just said, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. And for a second there, I thought maybe my computer had been recording my wife's conversation with me because I couldn't figure out how he would know to say that. So I said, what are you doing up at four in the morning? And he said, well, I'm in Romania. I'm on a different time zone. I'm visiting my brother. And I said, before I respond to you, may I ask what led you to tell me that? Why why did you tell me this? And he said, oh, that wasn't me. God just wanted me to share that with you. And that moment really changed my life. Um, it, 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 I felt for the for more than any any time in my entire life that God was present, that he was in this and that he knew exactly what the circumstances were. But more than that, the lesson itself changed my life. I've been someone who always feels a little bit responsible for the results of what I do. What I really realized in that moment was that when it comes to projects like this, I can't force the issue. I can't be responsible for the results. All I can do is make sure that whatever fish and loaves that I do provide, that they're as good and healthy as they can be. And the rest is not up to me. And the multiplication of that, whether it happens or not, is not up to me as long as I am responsible for and paying attention to doing the best with what I'm given and what I have to offer. And so that is why when it came time to kind of reevaluate what I was going to do next, and I was genuinely open to not making another movie. And if that's what God wanted for me, I was okay with that. So I poured myself into another short film for my church's Christmas Eve service about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds. And it was a 20 minute short film. And it, while I was doing it, I thought, boy, there's so much to explore here that hasn't been explored. And, you know, that's the kind of thing you can do in a multi-season show, but you can't do it in a movie. And I've never done, I've, you know, there's never been a multi-season show done yet. So wouldn't that be a great idea? But I didn't really have any idea, you know, designs on it. I was just doing this little thing for my church. And uh, very long story short, that's where The Chosen was birthed, is that short film ended up going viral. It ended up being the catalyst for us to crowdfund season one of The Chosen. We would show that short film on social media and let people know what we were thinking and uh, see if they were interested in potentially investing. It was released all over the world, and we ended up shattering the all-time crowdfunding record, uh, which had previously been held by projects that had big fan bases, and I had nothing. We were starting from scratch. And uh, we ended up, you know, raising over $10 million from over 19,000 people around the world, all based on the short film I did for my church's Christmas Eve service on a, on a farm in Illinois. When we broke the record and when all that money came in and we knew that we could shoot season one, I remember my wife and I were staring at the numbers on the computer and she started crying because she realized that God was pressing on her heart again, that this is what he meant by impossible math. And that's what we've seen on, at every step of the way with this project. Uh, from the beginning of what, like what I've been telling you to over the last two years to the fact that even just recently, 
when we decided to make the show even more free and more easily accessible by people around the world, not charging them a dime to watch it, we ended up generating even more income. <laughs> so it all doesn't make sense. It's all impossible math. But that's a, that's the very, very long answer to your short question about how this all came to be. Well, I love that, first of all. And, you know, that's why I love the term impossible math, uh, Dallas, because it's taking what doesn't make sense and it, and it makes sense and it works. And thanks for sharing the whole background on this, because to watch this expand to where it is now is just so amazing. And, I, and thanks for the clarification there on seasons versus episodes. <laughs> sure. Because now you're in the process of crowdfunding and raising the money for season two. I believe you're almost at the milestone, just about at the $5 million mark. Is that right? Yeah. So we, our seasons tend to be, even though there are eight episodes total, uh, we, we, in the first season, we split them up into two halves. So we shot uh, episodes one through four and released those uh, early in 2019. And then uh, we uh, shot and released the, the next four episodes in the summer and then released them in the fall of 2019. And so we're now we're pretty much probably by the end of the day that I, where you and I are recording this discussion, uh, we will be funded for episodes one through four of season two. So we're currently looking for location. We're 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 work, working out what we can do in light of the uh, quarantine, but that has come in from this pay it forward program. We didn't even open up a crowd fund again yet. We probably are still going to do that. Some offer an investment opportunity to the crowd again, but this has all been income that's been generated by people who watch the show and then they get the opportunity if they so choose to pay it forward and to allow other people to see it for free and for us to finance future episodes and seasons. And since COVID has come, which we thought would hurt us, has actually quadrupled and quintupled our our efforts and our pace. So it's, again, just been more and more impossible math. <laughs> so expand on the uh, pay it forward that you're talking about there, Dallas, because what's happening right now is really touching and moving. I mean, there, there's this message that's going around the world and it's going at an exponentially faster pace. So explain what that means, because a lot of people who are listening, I hope everyone who's listening to this podcast will go watch The Chosen. Uh, you can find it on VidAngel, you can get The Chosen app, you know, on Android or your iPhone. And so I know what you mean by pay it forward, but explain what you mean by that. Yeah. So when you download the app, it's free. You can go to the app store, or Google play, wherever you get your phone apps. And some of you may be thinking, I don't want to watch a show on a phone. Well, neither do I, but they, that angel who is our distribution partner literally created technology that allows you to connect this app on your phone to your streaming device. So Roku, Apple TV, fire stick, Chromecast, whatever you can be watching the show totally free and easy on your streaming device. And so people say, well, if it's free, how are you able to do more seasons? And we came up with uh, this idea of uh, the, the guys at VidAngel did this idea of, you know, when you're watching it and we say to you, listen, if you're enjoying it, it actually tells you for, first of all, it'll tell you this episode was, was paid forward for you by Dallas in Illinois or John in Iowa or whatever it is. You know, you can have the opportunity if you want to just send them a, a, an anonymous or, or otherwise thank you note. But when you're done, we, we say, look, if you want to keep this show going for future episodes and seasons, and if you want others to be able to watch the show free around the world, then you, know, you can pay it forward. And it, there's different levels offered and different perks that come with that. But And then there's, of course, a lot of people who don't pay it forward, who just lo like the show and who some of whom can't afford to pay it forward or people in other countries. The, the, the app is literally in every country in the world. And that's being translated into dozens of languages as we speak. And that all is made possible because people are literally paying it forward and allow it, giving us the opportunity to do that. So we don't force anything. We don't douse you with a bunch of commercials. Um, you know, you've seen the show, so you've seen that we don't, we don't really pressure you much. It's just a, listen, if you've, if you liked this and you want to keep it going, uh, here's how we do that. And uh, like I said, since we made the show free and since we made it as hassle-free as possible, the, there's been an explosion in terms of paying it forward and, uh, and people wanting to support the show. Yeah. And, you know, Dallas, I'll tell you one of the things that I've just loved about this is how real it makes the characters, if you want. And I say characters, these are real, real people, but how real Christ is, how real Peter is, Matthew, and some of these other people, and how relatable. You know, it suddenly makes what you read about in the Bible, so relatable. In other words, these are, these are people with their struggles. They're not perfect. None of, well, with the exception of Christ, you know, Peter had his struggles and so did so many of the other people around Christ and who he surrounded himself with and how he served. 
I think it's so touching to so many people. It's just interesting. I've been so fascinated by this. Hence why we're doing this podcast. You know, I go read through some of the comments from people who've watched the show and been a part of this and just across the board, the unanimous sentiment or feeling that you see is, you know, this was life changing. It's been so relatable to people that this is why I think they're so willing to pay it forward and move on this is because it touches people in a way that they have an experience. And it's just a whole new way to look at it that really brings Christ to life as a person who can reach out to the one, to each one of us being the one, if you will. And so I just think it's so relatable that this is why people are drawn and want to pay it forward. Yeah, I think that you're 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 speaking to if I was going to give a list of the top reasons that people have been so passionate about the show after they see it, that would certainly be in the top two or three, which is it sounds it sounds simple, but it for whatever reason hasn't been, is the idea that these were real people, these were human beings. So often when we see Jesus projects, we see these people portrayed as saints or as kind of presented formal figures. Uh, there's not much emotional connection or engagement. That's particularly true of the of portrayals of Christ. You oftentimes feel a kind of an emotional disconnect. He doesn't even strike you as someone that you would ever want to follow if he was around. He seems actually in a lot of Jesus projects kind of boring. But uh, what we've been trying to do is humanize these people, including Jesus. Now, of course, the show still portrays the miracles and it portrays Jesus as the sinless son of God and the Messiah and the divine. So that's there no matter what. But we're also showing him dressing a wound. We're showing him making fire for his food. We're showing him doing his bedtime prayers. We're showing him laughing and telling jokes. We're showing him hanging out with his friends, dancing at a wedding. <laughs> and and when we do that with all the people all that you see in this show, and you really do establish that these were real people living in real times and that these events actually happened, and that when you just read the little excerpts from the Gospels, which were not intended. The Gospels were not intended to be a TV show or to give backstory on all these people. The Gospels were intended to be essentially, you know, Jesus's greatest hits for the purpose of illustrating that he was the Messiah. And when you portray this in a show in a way that feels like other shows that you would normally binge watch, we believe that if you can see Jesus through the eyes of those who actually met him, you can potentially be changed and impacted in the same way that they were. That's what people are experiencing. They're saying, I identify with Mary Magdalene. I identify with Simon Peter. And then, therefore, I identify with the solution to their problems, or at least the rescue that Jesus provided. So it's, uh, it's, that's for sure been a big factor. Well, it's beautiful. And I, and I just, I'm so behind this. And, you know, it's been interesting. I've just been watching the tracker. I think you just passed 32 million views, <laughs> which is amazing to watch. And, yeah. and I love the vision. You know, one of the things we talk about a lot of becoming your best is the power of a vision and a plan. Talk about your vision for this because people can get behind this. This is a powerful vision. Yeah, I mean, we've got on a on a surface level, on a strictly practical material level, we want to do eight seasons. You know, we look at a show like Game of Thrones, which was eight seasons and, you know, was viewed by over a billion people around the world. And and the budget for those eight seasons was probably around a billion dollars. And, uh, you know, we, we're not going to need or spend that kind of money. But uh, we do believe that the greatest story ever told deserves something like that. It deserves to be seen by, you know, a billion people around the world and it deserves eight seasons. And so, you know, we want to give enough time that these, to, to these stories that they deserve. So we want to devote, for example, a season seven to the crucifixion and season eight to what happens after that and uh, not have to rush through these things like you oftentimes see. So we believe that, uh, you know, we want to, we, we're going to need to raise somewhere in the neighborhood, maybe a little bit more, but not too much of a of hundred million dollars for the eight seasons. And that may sound crazy, uh, but it's, you know, when, when 10 million came in just based on a short film on my friend's farm uh, in Illinois in just a few months, uh, that's, it, it's, it no longer seems at all unrealistic or unlikely. And so that's what we're trying to do is we want to, and so that, that's kind of on a practical material level, but, but um, I think on, a, on an impact level, uh, we want this to continue and to grow. And, and people are telling us every day, thousands of people all over the world are saying this is changing their lives. They've never loved the Bible more or been more interested in the Bible than they have when they've been watching this show. You know, they've never loved Jesus more than they have been watching this show. So even, and then we're hearing also from people who aren't necessarily believers or who maybe were on the fence or had a bad experience with church and have, have, have been kind of distant from God or from their, their church or from friends and family. We've been hearing from people who are saying, I, 
I am more passionate now than ever. I feel like I've come back to God or I feel like I'm learning about Jesus in a way that I haven't been because what I've heard in the past doesn't match what I felt in my heart or what I read in scripture. And this feels like the kind of Jesus that I would want to follow. And, uh, and so there's no reason why that can't continue. You know, it's interesting, Dallas, and I'll share something very personal. I don't typically get this personal on a podcast. Like I said, I think this podcast is a little bit different. I finished watching the last episode and I remember kneeling down and praying that night and asking, what can I do to move this message forward? What can I do to play a role? And it was very clear, have Dallas on your podcast. At least as a starting point, there was a couple other ideas, but this was one. That's why we're doing this podcast. So I reached out, found your cell phone and called you the next day. <laughs> but I think this is a story that resonates with thousands of other people wanting to do the same thing. Yeah, we. it's been really bizarre. I've met hundreds of our investors, who've some of whom have visited the set or I've talked to on the phone or whatever. And they say the same thing all the time. I mean, independent of each other, they say, I don't know what it was. I don't normally do this, but I felt I had to get involved. I had to invest. I had to pay it forward. I had to do something. Uh, it was just so full in my heart that I had to do this. That's an indication that this project is way bigger than I am and, and in far better hands than mine. And so it's, for me, it's been a, a bit of a, of, a, of a fun ride myself just to kind of see what God has been doing with it. Oh, I, I imagine. So on that note, what I would love to hear now on a – on a slightly different topic is, you know, you've been through season one, which was just off the charts, obviously, from this conversation. You're on the verge of starting season two up to this point. So throughout all the filming of season one, what were one or two of the biggest highlights from that whole experience of, of putting together season one and just the whole thing? Yeah, I would say probably the, the, the thing that stands out the most, we actually did a, a video on it. It's on our YouTube channel. It's called The Miracle of the Miracle of the Fish. Uh, the reason that this stands out is just because it encapsulates so much of what this project has been and what it's about. We were filming, we were set scheduled to film the scene from the Gospels, that's in episode four in season one, which is when Jesus calls Simon Peter after half having him, you know, cast fish on the other side of the boat. And Simon's been fishing all night and uh, hasn't caught a single fish. And, and Jesus says, try again, and he catches hundreds of fish. And uh, about four or five days before we were scheduled to shoot that scene, we didn't have fish, we didn't have a boat, and we didn't have a lake. Uh, all things that are pretty important in a scene like that. You know, call me crazy, but it felt like that we needed those elements. We just didn't have them. All of our all of our attempts to getting fish fell through. The lake was actually flooded at the time, meaning the the shore the shoreline was uh, underwater, and the boat was still being made. It had to be built in a very very short amount of time. But because of what had happened with the show from the beginning, particularly with the, the impossible math of how the show even came to be, I really just wasn't stressed out about it. I just thought, you know, whatever, typically whenever we have an idea for how something's going to work and then it doesn't work, what, it is, what ends up happening at the last minute is way better than what we would have done on our own. So uh, sure enough, you know, that morning as the lake had gotten down to its perfect depth and the boat was being towed uh you know, around the river or around the lake to get to us, uh, paint still drying. And our special effects guys, our visual effects guys uh, had said that we're going to create all these fish in post-production. And we just asked that you put together a big green tarp with water balloons inside of it that can be pushed and pulled into this net and put into the boat. And we'll replace that green, what we called the green burrito uh, <laughs> with, with fish. You can see, again, you can see the story on our, on our, on the chosen YouTube page, but you know, even even after we filmed it, and the the challenges that they faced in in creating these new brand new fish out of nothing, it it was all again impossible math. It was all something from nothing. It was all uh, an illustration of the feeding of the five thousand that we were just experiencing in real time, and uh, it was all uh, you know t consistently testing me to make sure that I really was in that headspace of it's not my job to feed the five thousand. It only provides the loaves and fish that I've gotten to make sure that they're as good and healthy as they can be. Now, of course, in this case, I didn't even have any fish to provide, <laughs> literally. But when you watch the scene now, it's one of the most famous scenes in the season and one of the most life-giving and inspiring scenes that people have seen. And I would challenge you to, to that, that if you saw it for the first time without knowing this story, you would have no idea that those fish weren't, weren't there when we were filming. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, I can't believe we're already at 30 minutes. That's amazing. <laughs> 
So oh, yeah. before we wrap up, I'll ask you two questions. Number one, just to remind everyone where they can go to get the app and how they can watch The Chosen. But then number two, any parting thoughts, comments that you'd like to make? The way to watch it, as I said, is, is you know, it's totally free and it's easy. Just download the, the Chosen wherever you get your phone apps. We're easy to find. But I just, you know, what, what what's important to me for people to understand is that when they watch this show, uh, it's going to feel different. You know, there's a there's a, a moment in episode seven when Simon Peter is frustrated that Jesus is calling Matthew, the tax collector, <laughs> to be part of the group of disciples because tax collectors were hated at that time. And Simon surely didn't want to be in the same uh, team of Jesus followers with a tax collector. And he says, uh, to, he's complaining to Jesus and Jesus just looks at him and says, get used to different. And that's a, a phrase that we've been living by with this whole project. And I think that that's what people have experienced when they've watched it, is that uh, it doesn't feel like a t- typical Jesus show. But at the same time, uh, that shouldn't scare you because it, it is made by someone in myself who loves the Bible, loves God's word, loves Jesus. And uh, people, when they watch it, they're like, even the scenes and moments that aren't from scripture, which is a lot of them, because uh, we expand it a lot with the historical context, the cultural context, the artistic imagination, some of the backstories that we created that we believe are plausible, if not factual. And uh, people uh, might might not be used to that, but they all come away from it thinking, my goodness, this feels like you know the, the the most biblical project I've seen, even though it's it's not a ver, you know a verse by verse recreation, and I think uh, I think that people will experience that if they're willing to to check it out. Well, I agree with you, and you know from my own personal experience, I'll just say I do believe there's a higher power here that's guiding this whole project, uh, that it will have the ability to influence hundreds of thousands, millions, and even you know your vision of a billion people. And so each one of us can do a part in this. You know, like you said, wherever a person is listening to this podcast is at regardless of where your faith or your belief or whatever, wherever you are, uh, you know, give this a shot. I mean, number one, it's been amazing what Dallas and their team has done in crowdfunding and raising the money to do this in the reach that it's experiencing the, and the exponential growth. But number two is like what you said, Dallas, it's the feeling that you get when you watch it. It's the desire to want to be a better person. It's the desire to be a better parent, you know, a better leader or coworker to simply want to be a better person. It's why so many people resonate with it. And so there's some deep feelings and emotions that go with it. I love the ability to connect with the characters, you know, like we mentioned earlier. And that's as a result of you not making it just superficial and quick through. You've you've really purposely done that. So we appreciate what you've done, Dallas, on behalf of, you know, everybody listening to this. Thank you for producing and directing this show. I hope that all of our listeners will go out and get the app, The Chosen, or, you know, just go search for The Chosen. You'll be able to find it and watch it. Uh, Get through all eight episodes in season one that they are life-changing. I'll call them that. I've experienced it. And then do our part. You know, if, if you're in a financial position where you can contribute for season two, great. Uh, paying it forward so that others can access and watch it, all a part of this. So Dallas, any parting thoughts before we wrap up? No, I'm good. You've covered it all. So I appreciate the chance to, to connect with you and uh, to, to you who are listening. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. And as you know, as all of our Becoming Your Best listeners, one of the phrases we use a lot is that one person can make a difference. And this is certainly one of those cases where, yes, you, every one of us can make a difference and pay it forward to use Dallas's words. So we appreciate you. We thank you. We hope this has been beneficial. Uh, Let's go out there and make a difference. So we hope you have a great day and a fabulous week. Thank you for listening. Would you like help to apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders in your life, in your family, or in your organization? Call us today at 888-690-690. 8764 to speak with a helpful representative to evaluate your situation and how we can help. Or you can visit becomingyourbest.com. Whether it's a corporate training event, keynote, workshop, trainer certification, or personal coaching, it would be our pleasure to serve your needs. Once again, call 888-690-8764 or visit becomingyourbest.com today.